conferences like this, at events like this, that we are able to acknowledge that there are sometimes differences in our beliefs on which tactics and strategies uh, do the most good and uh, which ones may not do as much good or may even possibly create net harms for the cause, but it's also extremely important that we do so in an atmosphere of, uh, of respect and of uh, treating each other uh, with, with good intentions and in realizing that we're all on the same team uh, for the animals. And so uh, there's a few things that, that this session is, uh, is not going to look like. And what it's not going to look like is uh, actually 10 years ago to the day, July 27, 2013, is where Gary Francione and Bruce Friedrich uh, had a conversation of this nature on the AR conference stage. And uh, their conversation, I was told, was going to be with an atmosphere of mutual respect. Uh, but that's not what happened. That's not what happened. And so tonight, you're going to see a very, very different temperature uh, in this conversation uh, because these two deeply respect each other's work. Uh, they know that they're on the same team. They're not here to score points on each other. They're not here to prove who's more right than the other. And that means that no one in this room is here to score points either or to cheer only when your quote unquote side scores a point. That is in no way how this is going to work. All of us are here to learn from each other. We're here to possibly even grow closer to each other from these conversations rather than uh, grow further apart. And uh, so yeah, I'm going to keep my intro real short. I just want to make sure that we're all here because we know that we're on the same team to do the most good for animals. And so uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring up our, our two presenters for the evening. Uh, David and Eva, please, uh, please walk up as you're ready. <laughs> David Cohen Heidi is a partner at Sharpen Strategy, provides support, guidance, and connections to emerging high impact animal organizations around the globe. Uh, before uh, Sharpen, he spent over a decade organizing with a group you might have heard of called the Humane League, uh, leading them as their executive director for many years, winning hundreds of campaigns against the world's largest food corporations. He also sits on the board of Sentient Media. He's a fund manager at the EA Fund uh, Animal Welfare Fund. Give it up for David Cohen Heidi, everyone. And Eva is a co-founder and program lead of Pax Fauna and of the Pro Animal Future, organizations that exist to design more effective social movements for animal freedom in the US, using original research as well as careful study of social movement literature and the recent history of the animal movement to reverse the cultural norm of eating animals. Also a DXE alumna and movement music leader, Eva has been organizing in the animal movement since 2015. She's a dedicated student of nonviolent communication, which is what we're obviously gonna see on this stage tonight, and and is committed to bringing uh, nonviolent communications repertoire of creative problem solving tools to the world of building a better culture in the animal movement. Give it up for Eva and once again, David. Yep, uh, All right. Hey everyone, welcome to our talk tonight. It's, uh, it's amazing to see you all here. I think when Eva and I heard that we were speaking at 8.30 p.m. on the first night. Uh, we assumed that all of you would be like up at the bar networking and hanging out with each other, so it's very flattering that you joined us here to talk about a topic that, like us, many of you are probably incredibly passionate about, and this is the ongoing debate in our movement for, you know, since the dawn of time, you know, abolition and welfare. And tonight we're going to be talking about how we can bridge this historical divide. And we're going to structure things like this. We're going to talk for maybe about half an hour about our perspective on this topic. We're going to sit down and have a little conversation, some of the questions we're interested in hearing the other answer. And then we're going to invite all of you through Whova to ask some of your own questions and enter into this conversation with us. But uh, as Michael said, just to manage some expectations, sorry to disappoint, Eva and I are actually friends. We actually share a lot of the same perspectives on this topic, which is why we wanted to present on it together, um, so you probably won't see much bloodshed up here tonight, sorry. Um, but before we get into it, we just want to talk a little bit about our background, so you have a good understanding of kind of the history that we're bringing to this debate, what we work on, what we're excited about. So I'll get started. Uh, indeed, you've heard a little bit of my bio already. My name is Dave Komen Heidi. Most of you probably know me uh, as a longtime leader of the Humane League until uh, about 18 months ago. Since then, I've been working at Sharpen Strategy. And if you know anything about these organizations, you know, I spent most of my professional career working on welfare campaigns. So at the start, that was cage 
cage-free campaigns, working on its battery cages, and later on also broiler chicken campaigns. I helped found the Open Wing Alliance, so we've been spreading this kind of work around the globe, and I, I'm just incredibly passionate about it. I, I'm not the kind of person who's naturally just attracted to incremental work and compromise. I actually come from the punk scene and radical activism and saw myself as a very uncompromising individual. So I have to warn you that I actually bring to this topic uh, the passion of a convert because I, I've come to truly believe that meeting society where it's at, getting wins on the scoreboard, incremental change over time where we can build power and pass laws and change major institutions. This is one of the things I'm most passionate about and I spent a lot of my career trying to persuade other activists to get involved in this kind of work. Um, so this is the, my background, and I'm joined on the stage by my colleague, Eva. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Good evening. Um, really, really amazed at the turnout, and so incredibly honored to share the stage with Dave. Again, you heard a bit of, a bit of my bio, and I, again, co-founder, program lead of Pax Fauna, Pro Animal Future. These are orgs that are currently running volunteer-powered ballot initiatives in Denver, Colorado, to ban slaughterhouses and fur sales. My journey of all, in all of this began in 2015 when I started organizing on a volunteer basis with DXE, Direct Action Everywhere, in Chicago. And that was right after DXE did their first open rescue investigations. We were doing protests of Whole Foods, whose farms had been investigated by DXE. And we were specifically interested in dispelling the humane myth and specifically cage-free conditions. And today I'm still interested in this kind of messaging, still support this kind of messaging, this kind of challenging the, the humane hoax. And in Pax Fauna, we've had, we've, in our research, we have found some promise in messages that do the same. These, these messages that draw attention to, to kind of the lies that corporations are telling us about the ways that animals are treated. And when we're choosing policies, we're really interested in telling a story of society moving together forward away from using animals for food completely. And so, when we think of the policies that we're, that we're curious, we don't, we're not really interested in, in welfare because of the particular message that we're trying to, to send, and we're choosing policies with an eye on what I think tells the story of total abolition. Um, also, some background about kind of where I'm coming from, Pax Fauna and Pro Animal Future and kind of DXE where I came from, we are really concerned with the, any perceived disconnect between volunteers and, and staff. We want kind of minimal of this. So we pay ourselves um, a flat, salary, nobody makes more than anybody else who, on, on staff. We pay ourselves exactly a living wage um, with this real eye on some of these really strong ideals that we're trying to aspire to of the grassroots movement. So what's the conflict? So we see this, this conflict that shows up in our movement, kind of the one that we named the talk after. Um, one axis that it can kind of exist on is welfare and abolition. So people who are working on compromise and incremental change versus those who are envisioning and demanding a future that has no use of animals at all. Reformers and radicals, this kind of like debate that's probably existed in every social movement in history, the kind of reformers and radicals idea. And I want to acknowledge at this point that welfareism isn't necessarily, welfareist isn't necessarily the term preferred. It's maybe one that was sort of coined by us abolitionists to say that they're doing something wrong. And um, I also want to acknowledge that this divide has gotten a whole lot better over the recent years, as, as, we've, as we've mentioned. I, I still have a little bit of a sting when I, I call Dave a welfareist, because like, there's this part of my brain that's like, well, he's your friend. You can't, you can't say that about him. But I promise that this is, um, he, he doesn't mind, and, <laughs> and that um, we, we aren't using this word as a, as a dirty word. And so... Speaking of Gary Francione, no presentation on this topic would be complete without a quote. The choice is not between reducing suffering or promoting veganism. It is only by promoting veganism, by working on the demand side of the equation, rather than the supply side, the focus on welfare reforms, that we, will focus, that we will reduce suffering and death. The reason I bring this up, this quote, is that it seems to hold this one piece of the divide very well. And without getting into kind of the, the content of the debate at this point, I want to draw attention to the tone. Like this sense that we're right because we know that we're right, and we're so sure, we're so sure that we're right, that it makes sense for us to spend our time criticizing other people without even really first attempting to understand what their theory of change is. 
I think it can be easier sometimes to find an opponent in the movement than without, than outside of it. I think it's, you know, for one, we care about what each other thinks. We, we're, we're also just more, more manageable. I mean, when we're kind of up against the entire institution of animal agriculture, a lot of times the opponents that we find are a little bit less interested in us and what we think. So there's this kind of temptation. There's this something that feels more powerful about infighting than, than about actually kind of doing the work sometimes. And I'm going to talk about abolitionism a bit wider than just Francione, who would reject a lot of the work that those of us in the room who consider ourselves liberationists or abolitionists are working on. This, this broader sense of welfareism would, would think that, well, sorry, broader sense of abolitionism would say that welfareism is kind of only negotiating the terms of our exploitation of animals and not really challenging kind of the basic existence of it. And th these folks would still be interested in doing something like a fur ban, like product bans, like particular policies that got us closer to abolitionism, um, stuff that Francione's work would sternly reject. And, and it's kind of this broader sense of ab abolitionism where I place my work. Thank you. So we can imagine the divide falling on these kind of two axes even. So we have welfare abolition, and we also have professional versus grassroots. So thinking of those of us in the, in the grassroots kind of thinking our, of ourselves as like part of this, of this nonviolent social movement. And those in the, the professional side thinking about building infrastructure in professional organizations. And these words are going to mean different things to different people, professional, grassroots. I mean, on one hand, like, professional kind of just means that you're being paid, and some of us in the grassroots do kind of reluctantly get paid for our work, so we don't need other jobs. And it's okay that we aren't all sharing kind of the exact same definitions of these, of these words. Um, I think we, we can all agree on is that these, these two sides, the kind of more professional, welfareist, side and the more grassroots abolitionist side. They, they do represent these certain clusters of beliefs and opinions and stories and assumptions about our advocacy and about the world. And so for welfareist types, it's often going to be like this focus on measurable impact for animals in coming years, focus on um, trying to, to measure and compare like different forms of, of suffering and violence and the number of animals that are impacted, interested in changing institutions and laws, a belief that these angry and weird protests are probably harmful and it would probably be better to kind of seem normal, seem kind of buttoned up. And most importantly, this belief that we have to be realistic and that activists are probably living out pipe, dream, pipe dreams, basically doing performance art. And, and for the grassroots, the, this, this cluster of, of beliefs looks like we want to inspire a mass movement of activi activists. We want to boldly challenge the status quo, and we'll do so with righteous moral indignation. We're really comfortable using kind of moralizing and philosophical language. We're really interested in civil disobedience and the ability, the, the willingness to make real sacrifices because the stakes in this movement are so high. And a sense that we really want to be able to envision the world that we want to see at the end of all of this. And so maybe you recognize yourself in, in some parts of, of these clusters, and I think every individual in the room is probably going to have a slightly different kind of formulation of, of all of these kind of factors if we're kind of imagining it as, as a quadrant, as a spectrum. But if we're thinking about like, the state of our movement, the reality is that these, we have these kind of poles that generally divide us. And we're going to be using these terms very imprecisely and very generally, um, generally associating professional with welfare, welfareism and, and grassroots with abolitionism, though that, they don't always fit together perfectly, and that's kind of okay for the sake of the, the conversation. So what we're describing, as Eva mentioned, is not only just typical of social movements and social causes. It's actually just unavoidable. There's always going to be a tension between these kinds of things. How much would we be asking for? The radicals and the incrementalists are going to have a very different point of view on these kinds of questions. So what we're proposing is really that the problem is not that there's a divide between which of these two strategies is correct. What we're proposing is the problem is our movement's engagement with this question and the kind of unsophisticated way that we've been arguing about this topic. Um, you know, I, I think that the way we've been approaching this has two major costs for the movement that I see. The first is that we just waste a lot of time. We have unproductive, endless philosophical conversations and debates where you see kind of bad faith attempts to 
persuade and engage with the other side that's just completely about self-expression. We see people endlessly go back and forth and create hurt feelings and stress and tension and judgment about what others in the movement are working on. Um, and I, you know, I, I had an epiphany, I, I remember a few years ago, I was ranting at my wife about Metallica's first few albums and like why they're a really good representation of like thrash in its purest form and why they're so awesome and why like these later albums that have this more commercial appeal and like these different kinds of songs and time signatures and like the look in her eyes like as they glazed over and just like total <laughs> boredom. I first realized like how I sounded in that moment. <laughs> and then I had this larger epiphany of like, oh my God, like this is what me and all my animal rights friends sound like when we're talking about this shit. <laughs> like the, it is the same thing. Like this is what Tyson wants: is for us to be having these like endless navel gazing conversations that don't mean anything to anyone but us. This is not productive. This is what our enemies like us to be doing. The second problem that this creates for our movement is that it greatly narrows the strategic options that we see in front of us. When we're identifying in this tribal way with this like one piece of the movement, the one strategy, the one approach, the one certain kind of group that we like and that we identify with, we kind of hone in on a narrow, our own aperture of what's possible. What are the different things that a social movement can do to succeed? What are the different approaches we can experiment with? What are we gonna be doing over time as our strategy evolves? Instead, we need to be asking ourselves, how can these different elements of our movement leverage each other and work together, move towards common and shared goals? So there's many different theories of social movements out there. Uh, this is one I like from the Any Institute. I believe that there was a talk on this topic earlier today that maybe some of you saw um, from Animal Think Tank. Um, but essentially, uh, they describe the kind of three categories of necessary work that a social movement has to succeed. The first is personal transformation. So as you might expect, this is winning hearts and minds. This is persuading individuals to come over to our side, creating new leaders, bringing in those activists who are gonna join our cause. Um, you can imagine many examples of this happening in our movement, of course. There's changing dominant institutions. So this is when you're going out and trying to pass laws or get corporate policies or you know, change the institutions that make up society. And the third is alternatives. And this is where you envision and create the alternatives that are gonna build up the world that we'd like to see. So an obvious example for us would be meat alternatives, right? What are we going to be eating? Changing dominant institutions, this element is really what a lot of the people in this room are probably focused on, things like campaigns. Uh, and this can be broken up into even more granular elements that you'll probably recognize. There's the inside game, so this is individuals who are perhaps lobbying or maybe you know, doing grassroots lobbying with politicians, speaking to elites, maybe folks working inside the system as our allies to help create change, people operating within the structure of power, speaking that language, and so on. Then there's structured organizing. So these are like larger NGO organizations who are able to capture people power by representing large memberships, representing large groups of citizens who share a common belief, they're able to put pressure on decision makers through that representation. And then there's mass mobilization. So popularly this will be things like um, the Occupy movement or, or Black Lives Matter. Um, I think um, Animal Rising is probably a good example of a group in our movement that's trying to harness this strategy. Regardless of which theory of change you want to use, or excuse me, regardless of which um, movement analysis, like kind of movement ecology you want to use to analyze uh, what we're trying to do here, at the end of the day it's going to look something like this, right? It's going to be a combination of different strategies that work in concert toward a shared goal. It is not the case that we should look at any one of these elements and the expectation of a particular strategy or approach is that it alone is going to get there for us. It's just going to be a part of this larger movement, providing one element towards our shared success. So the question is not, should we all just do inside game, or should all of our resources go into personal transformation and vegan outreach? That's the wrong question. The question is, what is the correct allocation of our resources, and how well are we executing each element of this shared strategy? Can we set aside the tribal feelings and the annoyance when we engage with the other pieces of this pie that are quite different than us? And can we see those people as our allies? So tonight, 
I want to be doing my part because I've definitely had those knee-jerk reactions and those tribal instincts many times uh, over my career as an activist. And indeed, I've often been quite impatient and frustrated and annoyed with what I've seen as time-wasting activism that's just about self-expression or that is overly divisive or that doesn't have some clear measurable goal that I'm thinking about in my context of like, what is the law we're working towards? What's the policy we're working towards? What's the incremental ratcheting of change that we're working towards? And I have to say that in the last few years, through making friends like Eva and other friends in the room, I've kind of reconnected with this younger, more radical self and, and remembered that time in my life. And I've come to see how important it is to have this rich, diverse set of theories of change and strategies and opinions working together. So I want to reflect a little bit on what I see as some of the essential strengths that the grassroots or the liberationists or the abolitionists or whatever you'd like to call this cluster of groups and beliefs in our movement bring to our cause that are absolutely essential. So I want to start by saying I think one of the most, perhaps the most fundamental contribution of this side of the movement is that they are focused on what motivates activists. They are fully tapping into why all of you are here in the room with me tonight. And the reality is, for the people in here, I see some of you who've been working on these kind of incremental corporate campaigns or laws for many years. These activists, most of them come from the radical grassroots, the people who've been most influential and effective, the most hardcore of the corporate campaigners come from that world. Um, and I think that we can't lose sight of this because what the grassroots is providing, this clear moral message, this beacon that's out there for the people like us in this room to be able to see there are people like us who see factory farming, who see what's happening to animals, and they understand and relate to this in the same way that I do. This is essential to bring people into our cause and to teach them the stakes of what we are fighting for. And I think even many of us who came into activism through this have come to forget that. And this is connected to a second incredible strength of this part of the movement, which is that it inspires great personal sacrifice from volunteers. It brings people in, it teaches them the stakes. And I mean, I'm sharing the stage with someone who's facing felony charges for doing an open rescue. That's right, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah the, the fire and the passion for our cause, which is what our cause demands. The grassroots activists are absolutely correct in their assessment of the situation. This is something that is inspirational to all of us in the movement and to the public at large, and it's an essential piece of changing our society for the better. I think another area where I see the grassroots as really leading in our movement is framing our issue as one that is not just about consumerism and what people have on their plate, but one that is about citizenship and about people's role in society with a moral issue. I think that um, Eva it really did some amazing research at her organization, Pax Fauna, recently. You have to go to their website to check it out. It talks a lot about how important it is that we take this strength that we have, framing this moral issue with citizens to show that they have power. This is incredibly important. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that we should be using any opportunity we can to use markets and consumerism and, and diet change to help animals, we should completely maximize what's effective here. But we can't lose sight of another essential project, which is to build a block of engaged citizens who are fighting with us to speak up for animals. And I have to give credit where credit is due. While there are certainly some radical abolitionists who only want to talk about vegan diet change, the reality is that I believe the grassroots has been the most focused on this idea of how do we develop a large engaged group of activists who are willing to do what it takes. And I have to give credit where credit is due. Right. <laughs> um, so finally, I think that the grassroots provides an essential critique and counterbalance to the larger institutional approach. I think it's important for people who are making clear to everyone what it is we're fighting for, who are making sure that groups as they grow are keeping their foot on the gas 
that we're continue to ask for as much as we can, that we're accelerating, that we are painting the vision of what's possible in the world. This is essential to provide a radical flank for the more moderate groups to compare themselves and differentiate themselves from in larger society. If you look at any successful social movement, this is an incredibly key piece of the ecosystem. So, in an effort to continue to heal for the movement, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, for everyone who identifies with that side of the movement, thank you. And I'll hand things over to you. So sometimes in the grassroots, we talk about the other side, like they just want incremental baby steps. Like we're the only ones who really want, you know, animal liberation tomorrow. And I want to challenge that idea a little bit, because, I mean, this idea of incrementalism, this, this idea that you know, only one kind of side of this debate is, is taking small steps to get to where we're going. I mean, unless anybody here has a plan for, for seeing you know, animal freedom for everyone tomorrow, we're all making some kind of incremental steps to get there. And that might be looking like a lot of different ways, a lot of different strategies, a lot of different pieces of that kind of pie movement ecology, and all of us are incrementalists, kind of exactly to the same degree. We're trying to get somewhere that we aren't yet. And also this idea about abolitionism, we kind of mentioned that welfareist was certainly like a bit of a slur at first. And given that we're all, we're all here, we're all looking for the same future, right? Like we're all abolitionists in terms of the end goals that we want. And I, I want to kind of break down that, that idea that this, this idea of like incrementalism means that like we're more pure somehow. Um, so the idea here, obviously with Dave and I coming um, to, to speak together, with, with me kind of coming to, with, from this like liberationist side of the, the movement and Dave like literally having a welfare tattoo, um, <laughs> is, it's real, um, is, is to kind of demonstrate a spirit of working together. Like that we can sort of hold these different identities and have them be different and we can work together to, to make good things happen without kind of compromising what is important to, to us. And so in that spirit, I also want to acknowledge some of these strengths of the professionalized side of the movement. These first two, like building power in these large organizations in order to change institutions, is this way of building like legitimacy in the eyes of power holders. And on, on the grassroots side, we're really interested in norms, really interested in, in social norms kind of held by the public. And a kind of other side of this coin is thinking about the, the power that we hold right now, or tomorrow, or you know, soon, in, in halls of power. So the idea here is that even if you hate welfare campaigns, like even if it just kind of makes your skin crawl to ever ask for something like bigger cages, the idea that we, the movement, should have a seat at the table where discussions are happening that affect animals, it, it feels like a no-brainer. And what these big organizations are doing, this kind of inside game, is is giving us that, giving us movement contacts inside positions, inside institutions with a lot of power. You might have heard welfareism straw mans like they want bigger and bigger cages until everyone is free, like as if the cage is going to get so big it, there's no cage anymore. Um, and and when we talk about incrementalism in this in this in this way, that's not my understanding. It's not how I've kind of heard anybody on that side ever describe it. Like when we're talking about incrementalism. It's in these political victories and, and winning something today so that we can win something bigger tomorrow. And I think that we can also give, a, give some credit to the professional side of the movement by, uh, for giving us some interest in measuring impact, having a kind of really sober view of our own work and wondering, like, is, is our work working? Is, is the stuff that we're doing actually effective? This is something that I, I credit the professional side of the movement for, for a couple of reasons. One is large organizations, by virtue of being large, need a lot of funding, and by virtue of needing a lot of funding, need to be able to be credible with donors. And that's, that sort of requires that you can convince somebody outside of you know, your own inner circle that what you're doing is, is effective and sort of more and more people. And there's also this, this piece that we get that, that y'all get in the professional movement where you have some kind of professional um, boundaries. And the, the way that it can sometimes feel in the grassroots, which I love to a large extent, really, really enjoy this, is that the movement can be our entire lives. 
especially since we are trying to mobilize volunteers, people, you know, people who go to work all day and then come do work for us for free, and all we can offer them is purpose and meaning and, and really important social connections. And these are some really big needs to, to meet as an organization for, for your people. And when we're just giving so much of ourselves to, to, to the work and, and not having that kind of professional distance where like, yes, it's important to me and I can go home sometimes, because I'm not living with these people, for example, um, it can be a little bit harder sometimes for us in the grassroots to really be sober about like, have I been spending my time in a way that is effective? And I think that that's something we can really learn from, from this other side. Um, I'll also kind of give some caveats to this, this focus on, on data. There are a couple kind of pitfalls I want to name. Um, of course, when we're looking at data, we're not always looking at strong data. And the kind of classic example of this is, is that the movement spent really a long time, a lot of resources, talking about like vegan leafleting, giving people leaflets to try to get them to go vegan. And maybe with a little bit more data, we were able to pivot and able to say, like, okay, maybe we maybe want to put our, our resources somewhere else. Another kind of uh, metaphor I want to bring up is this idea of like you, you, drop your, you drop your glasses in a dark spot and then you want to go look for them where it's light because you can see there, um, even though that's not really where you're going to find what you need. This, this idea that like, just because something is measurable doesn't mean it's where we ought to be, ought to be looking. The measurability isn't necessarily related to, to the effectiveness. And this willingness to look at our own work success with a really critical eye is something I think we should all really strive to embody. So what about the actual con conflicts in strategy? I mean, like, these arguments are happening for a reason. And we don't really expect to like, shut them down completely here, but I want to address a few of them. We're going to address a few of them in the section. In, in the interest of painting a picture of what a healthy move, movement ecology could look like. And this first one is really big. This idea that we hold um, as abolitionists, that welfare does more harm than good. You might be familiar with this idea, but I'll kind of articulate it in case you aren't. It, this is the idea that if we're celebrating welfare victories or advocating for welfare reforms, then we are telling people that it is fundamentally okay to use animals for food or whatever else, so long as you treat them well. And that by, by communicating that implicitly, we are doing animals at a service and, and our work is doing more harm than good. And there's, see, there seems to be no actual evidence of this. Like, it's something that I feel in my bones, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to say it's ever okay to use animals for any reason. I want animal liberation now, as we've been saying since, you know, I joined in 2015. <laughs> And, and still, when there has been research, and there hasn't been a whole ton of research, about this idea, it, we haven't gotten any evidence that exposure to victories, messaging around victories in welfare, we haven't gotten any evidence that that leads to less opposition to animal farming as a whole. We have a little bit of kind of research data, and we also have a lot of, um, I mean, look at the countries that, where animal welfare is the highest. That's also a place where the, the public tends to be the most sympathetic to movement goals, thinking about um, like Sweden and Austria and Switzerland. Like, there there's, seems to be no relationship to, to um, adding welfare and reducing opposition to animal farming. Another assumption I've heard many times from my side of the movement is that uh, extreme activism, so imagine, you know, confrontational protests, maybe nonviolent resistant things like stopping traffic or interrupting everyone's dinner at a restaurant and so on, that this is something that's bad and that this is a weakness of the radical grassroots and that this is a strength of the professional organizations that they present in a much more palatable and normal way. Uh, now, I, I've often heard the question debated in our movement, is it good or bad to use disruptive or radical demonstrations? Now, the reality is there's no yes or no answer to this question. We know a lot about nonviolent protests, and we know a lot about disruptive protests. We know that they're incredibly powerful. These are very, very powerful tools. They can be transformative in changing society, in getting our issue on the table. They can also be quite unhelpful in generating a lot of bad press and be counterproductive and turn off decision makers. At the end of the day, it's not so much a question of is this a good or bad tactic? Just like any tactic, the question is instead, is now 
the correct time to use a disruptive protest or an extreme protest or to block traffic or whatever it is? Is it the right time in whatever country you're working in, whatever context you're working in, and whatever that moment in the political debate is? Now, uh, this is a too complex of a question to answer, and the reality is, in any of those situations, reasonable people are probably going to disagree on what the right thing to do is. But you can actually have a productive conversation about that. And what I really want, and I want to speak to my people in the audience, the thing that's important to remember here is that, you know, I think you, you have to avoid the fetishization of seeming normal and seeming persuasive and logical and coming across as like a regular person who doesn't make people uncomfortable. I think often that this is really highly prized by my people. And you should not mistake this for anything more than just another set of tactics. Sometimes, yes, coming across as being very normal and coming across as, you know, a persuasive elite or whatever it is, sometimes that's the right choice. If you're talking to your state senator, go for it. That's 100% the right thing to do. But that's all it is. It's just another tool in the toolbox. And it's very important that we not to begin to identify with the aesthetic or the kind of tactics that our branch of the movement is using because it limits what we're gonna be able to do together. Finally, I wanna address this, this idea we sometimes hold in the grassroots that professionalizing is going to hurt us and hurts the movement in general. The idea here is that professionalizing is gonna require us to have these big kind of bloated lumbering organizations that aren't very agile and really able to turn on our feet very easily. And it'll make us kind of more beholden to big funders that it'll, it'll leave labor on the table by not allowing regular people to contribute to their greatest potential. And I want to kind of follow with this, this same logic that like this is a tool that can achieve a goal. It's a strategy that will sometimes make sense for, for what we're doing. And while there are certainly strengths to the grassroots approach, there are definitely situations where it's really important. It's going to be really useful to have big professional organizations. Um, I mean, it's, it's undeniable that it's going to be useful, especially in moments like, like this. I'm thinking about like the EATS Act. That's, for those who don't know, legislation that's currently in Congress in the US that would prohibit states from requiring the meat and eggs sold within their borders to adhere to animal welfare restrictions. And this is really big and going to be big for the, going to be very, very damaging both to, I mean, to all of us, to, to, to the movement. And it's something that us on the grassroots are not equipped to handle as well as, I'm, I mean, I'm so glad that we have big groups like HSUS able to work on this kind of thing, able to have the big professional infrastructure, the funding, the lobbyists, to be able to address like really big kind of federal threats that are, that are coming up. Move on. So, what should we be arguing about instead? You know, we're not saying that you shouldn't think about any of the topics that we just discussed. Um, and we're also not saying that you should assume that every tactic and every strategy has equal value. You know, the reality is just like we've been saying, you know, sometimes professionalizing is the right choice, sometimes it's harmful. Sometimes a disruptive protest is the right choice, sometimes it's harmful, and so on. What we need to do is just move beyond this kind of binary way of thinking learning to have a more effective conversation with each of each other about a larger strategic project that we can work on together. These endless debates, they ultimately just lack sophistication. They reflect poorly on us as a movement. It shows we're not thinking about things in a serious way that actually threatens our opposition. So, just some basic examples of conversations that might be more productive for all of us to have with each other. What are some of the potential shared objectives that we could all work towards? What's missing from the pie we were showing you earlier, this ecology of different kinds of organizations and strategies that we need in the movement? What should the allocation of resources be across all these different kinds of strategies? And the last thing on earth that Eva and I want you to take away from this talk is that everything is good, that we should all just clasp hands with one another and thank each other for the great work that we're doing because what everyone is doing is equally valid. Just to be extremely clear, I will state it here. There is a difference, a big difference, between good things 
and bad things. The reality is most strategies, most tactics, are very far from optimal. And in fact, most social movements do not succeed. They fail. And it's because of this. It is because the stakes are so high and because we are unlikely to succeed unless we have an incredibly rigorous and thoughtful and sophisticated understanding and discussion of the strategies and tactics and choices available to us as a movement and the interplay of all these choices that we will make together, we're very unlikely to succeed. That is why we need to have this conversation. So, what can we do as individuals right now to start improving in this? The first thing that I think all of us can commit to in this room right now is to do no harm. Do not stand in the way of what other organizations are attempting. Do not engage in petty tribal conflict between different sectors of the movement. The second thing is to experiment. Try out new approaches. Open your mind. And instead of seeing other groups with different approaches and other activists who have a different mindset than you as the competition or the ill-informed people who aren't getting in line, instead, try to open up a little bit of gratitude. Wow, I'm really glad that there are activists who are willing to do these risky, intense demonstrations. Or I'm really glad that there's people who want to go to law school and put on a suit and talk to politicians. I'm sure there's someone out there doing something that you would rather die than do as your form of activism. You should be grateful that they're here with us. These are our friends. They're helping us. And you also need to hold your identity very likely. This goes back to what I was talking about, is identifying with a particular strategy or tactic. What everyone in this room needs to accept is that 10 years from now, you're probably going to be working on something very different than what you're working on right now. And if that's not the case, that means that we're losing. It's a serious problem. Like, you should want to be working on something different in 10 years. And what this means is that you shouldn't identify as, oh, I'm a hardcore grassroots person. I'm a hardcore this or that person. It's, it's OK for you to have a group within the broader movement that you identify with, a group that maybe just aesthetically and culturally and because of your point of view and your theory of change you associate with and gravitate towards and it's your friends and people like you. Just don't, ex don't mistake it for more than that. This doesn't mean that all of you are right and others are wrong. It just means that this is your part of the movement right now. I think it's important to embrace movement ecology or some other form of analysis, start learning and thinking more about what a sophisticated and broad movement can look like, what are the other elements that you don't know much about yet, and can learn more about and understand how it might work with what you're doing. And finally, and this is something, again, we can all commit to in this room, this is a great opportunity to make this happen this weekend, is make some new friends in other parts of the movement, just like Eva and I have connected. It's very easy to go to tables and find other folks who are doing things something, something totally different than what you're doing, and sit down with them and chat with them, learn about what they're working on, figure out why they're dedicating their life to this right now. What's their theory of change? What do they like about it? What are the challenges that they're facing? Leave the conference with a few of these people in your phone that you can call up and ask questions from and ask advice and swap books that you should read, what was influential to you in your activism. Everyone can commit to this right now. Find a few of these people tonight at the bar after this talk. Make this happen. This is something, this is homework for everyone in this room. Uh, I will now hand things over to Eva to wrap things up. Okay. So I want to, yeah, double click to the 20th time today. And I love that there are so many talks today that, that mentioned it. Um, yeah, Leila and, and Elmira earlier. The movement is an ecosystem. And when we're critiquing each other's work, it, off, it doesn't make sense to critique it on the basis of whether it's a good version of our work that we have many different pieces that are serving very, very different functions, and of course they look very different, and of course one is a pretty bad version of another, but that's kind of not the, not the point of it. I don't want to be too cute about this, but the animals don't need infighting, that when we're choosing to spend our time critiquing other groups, I want to suggest that we be really, really honest with ourselves about what outcome we're hoping to see from that. Of course, there's a place for critique. Of course, when I you know, send somebody a draft blog post from another org and I ask for their feedback, I want, I want that, and that makes me better. 
And a lot of the time when we're having, when we're having arguments or just talking bad about other organizations when they aren't present, the outcomes that we're expecting, I, I want to be really curious about. Are we expecting this to be our contribution to the movement? I want to imagine a, a combined strategy, a sense that even while staying in our lanes, even while doing the work that we do best, there are ways that our, our work can build on each other in, in a way that doesn't kind of take away from, from one, but in, in fact is kind of the best, the best versions of each of our work. And finally, we, we've talked at length today about kind of what sets us apart and how when we step back, it's clear that we share a lot more common ground than not. And I want to talk about this because we're, all of us here in this room are part of this tiny, unique faction of humans that sees animals not as just like cute and fun and, and useful, but as an actual political class that deserves real protection. And when I think about how rare that is in the world, it, it just breaks my heart. I mean, I think about like when I was, when I was a baby vegan for the first 10 years, I, I didn't know any other vegans, like, like not even, no activists, but no other vegans. Like it felt like for a decade, like I was the only person in the world who saw animals in the way I do, or in the way that we do. And now we all have each other, and we've, we've come up with a lot of ways to divide ourselves and to, to think about ourselves like we're opponents instead of like all here together as allies. But I just want to, yeah, name just how much, like, how much has changed and how much more unity there is now. And, and the fact that like this kind of presentation can can even happen now, kind of with the context that, that we've seen in the past. Like when I, I mean, even just when I first joined the movement, this, like the collaboration and mutual respect that we're seeing now just seems completely impossible. Um, so what, what I want to leave you with is, is this, that every single person in this room and every single person in this movement looked at this problem of animal agriculture, this problem that's 10,000 years in the making, and, and looked at it and said, like, yeah, I, I think I can make a difference in that. I think that it's worth it for me to put my time into this giant thing. And all of these people are trying to build a, a kinder, better world for animals whose names we're never going to know and whose faces we're, we are never going to see. And it is so amazing that in the unlikeliness of all of that, and in the rarity of all of that, it is so amazing to me that we have each other. So as a reminder of this, we are going to pass out some buttons. They say pro-animal. And we invite, them, we invite you to take them and, and wear them as, as a symbol of our common goal and our common identity. Remember that our movement is far too small to be divided. And remember that it's not about winning arguments with each other. It's about winning a better world for animals together. Please give it up for Eva and David, everyone. A little bigger than that, come on, really give it up for them. Really give it up for them. And we got about, we got at least 15 minutes for Q&A here. We said this was gonna go till 10, but I was thinking at least an hour, it's been 45 minutes, so let's start with 15 and see what mood we're in after that, I guess. Does that work for y'all? Sure. Um, I really just first wanted to thank you two for this fantastic presentation, how thoughtfully you two built this together. Uh, this is really the abolition conversation that I wish we had had when I first joined the movement. Um, I know uh, Dave knows this, Eva, I'm not sure you know this about me, but I, um, I took part in some of the nastier abolition welfare conversations on stages like this, and it's one of my biggest like, shame points in the movement. I cherry-picked data to make the abolition side look better than the welfare side. I you know, snuck points in the last one minute of my talk that, was, that I knew was gonna put the welfare speaker uh, kind of on the defense and, and, and score points in the audience, and I got huge applauses, and when I left that stage, I was like, I don't feel good at all. I actually feel really shitty uh, because I didn't actually do anything or help anything for the cause or for the movement. And that's because I was kind of put up to it, I think, by people wanting to see me as one of the heroes of the abolition side of the movement. And it was just a really horrible way to spend my first few years in the, few years in the movement. And I just thank you two so much for having this conversation on this stage instead. Anyone who is new to the movement, you just are being welcomed into a much like safer and warmer and healthier movement than the one that I came in 
into. So uh, thank you two for that. <laughs> Overwhelmingly, the top voted question was, uh, can either of you name a social movement? Uh, they said past, but past or present, I would say, that has bridged a similar divide to this and managed to be successful at kind of uh, merging the more radical and the more incrementalist uh, wings of the movement. Uh, you know, okay, let me think. I, I don't know if the realistic goal is ever that there's like some total cohesive organism acting as the unit where everyone is really in lockstep towards a shared goal. Um, I think what we can point towards are historical examples where there's clearly been an interplay of organization, just like the, um, the, the any institute that I showed. Like, they have many different examples, everything from um, the United you know, Farm Workers to uh, marriage equality, where you see this really complex interplay of organizations that are focused on individual transformation, doing radical disruptive protests, um, creating statewide political organizations and, and doing lobbying, uh, and, and all of the above. Like the, Basically, every successful social movement you've ever heard of has done that. There's been, of course, huge amounts of infighting. Like This is something that we will not solve, but instead learn to live with and manage, I think, is what we're suggesting here. There will never be a time where this tension and conflict doesn't exist. Um, it's just a matter of how we address it. I will say, so I'll just in closing, we'll say, I highly recommend the book The Engagement about the fight for marriage equality in the United States. To me, this is like an incredibly great uh, and deep analysis of a complex social movement. So that might be a good place to start for whoever asked this question. Yeah, the thing I'll add is that we aren't always going to be aware of the, the ways that infighting didn't happen. We're, we're not always going to be able to kind of look at, look at history and say that, um, well, because, you know, this, this piece of, of infighting, these two groups didn't, didn't clash, um, therefore they were successful. I mean, when we, we think of kind of the spectrum of this conflict, I think on one end I have this very idealized idea that we can have this like really cool good cop, bad cop dynamic where we have the, the kind of radical flank on the outside, like the literal outside of an institution putting pressure on it while we have our, our contacts on the inside. And, and there are, you know, stories of, of situations like that manifesting where the coordination is so kind of graceful that there's a really synergistic effect. And... On the other side, we are just kind of wasting each other's time by engaging in endless debates. And that's the kind of thing that can really just take the momentum out of, out of our work and, and waste a lot, of, or a lot of resources. And so it's, it's definitely not kind of an either or, we're working together beautifully or we're fighting um, in a way that's slowing us down. But definitely a, a whole kind of spectrum that can exist between those two points. Thanks, absolutely, I agree with all of that. And um, there's kind of a, one question that was asked two different ways, so I'm gonna merge it into uh, maybe the same question. Uh, so one was asked, uh, the term incremental is often used synonymously with welfare, uh, but does embracing incremental change necessarily mean embracing welfare reforms? Couldn't there be ways to make incrementally, explicitly abolitionist reforms? And then the inverse of that is someone else asked um, that um, grassroots was presented as synonymous with abolitionists and, well and liberation but couldn't you see there be a grassroots act ad, uh, advocacy for welfareism? So kind of take that question either or both ways as you see fit. Yeah, I mean, my, uh, my colleague uh, Aiden, I don't know where you are, wrote a, a great blog about this on Pax Fauna, this idea you know, that everyone is, is an incrementalist. Of course, it's not only welfare that is incrementalism, as I was, I was saying earlier. I mean, even if we're talking about getting everybody to go vegan one by one until the whole world is vegan, this is an incremental change. If we're talking about having mass protests so that social norms are changed little by little until it's no longer acceptable to consume slaughtered meat, that's, that's an incremental change. And I can also acknowledge the, the piece around, yes, of course, we can have a professional group that is abolitionist and, a, and, and vice versa, a more grassroots group that has more of a welfare ask. Um, and it just so happens that we, we tend to see these things clustered together, and so we use them sort of synonymously, though they fully, fully aren't. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think, you know, one, one thing I often see in this conversation is like the, the search for this kind of like perfect ask or policy where it's incremental in the sense, like I feel like banning fur is a great example of this, 
where clearly it is an incremental change. Like, this is not the largest of uh, groups of animals who are being farmed. This is not like an incredibly popular consumer product. We're not totally radically shifting society, but it's clearly an incredibly important step in the path we're all on to you know, increase society's uh, status that they place animals in and so forth. And I think we spend a lot of time, like this is to me completely about our internal gaze of like the, finding this perfect policy. And it's like, well, we can't ask for larger cages because this somehow implies to everyone that using animals is okay. Our audience, the voters, the people we're speaking to in the newspaper, they are not thinking about things in this way. I'm a big fan of uh, Martin Bollock's theory of how society kind of changes their view of animals over time and this gradual progression where you start with things like banning just like wanton cruelty towards animals and then the more frivolous things like cosmetic testing on animals and animals in entertainment and then you move to fur bearing animals and so on and so forth. I mean this might evolve in different ways in different countries but I think we should just spend a little bit more time like thinking about our audience and how they view society's relationship with animals and their relationship with animals. And I think that this point that is so meaningful to all of us is like this moral distinction between asking for a bigger, bigger cage versus banning a specific practice and how we kind of like narrowly divide all these different things into what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. This is like very navel gazing to me. I don't know. I think like at the end of the day, we're all working towards incremental change. Some people may not be into asking for some of those things. Again, this is fine. It's like find what you're fired up about and want to work on. But at the end of the day, I just find these kinds of like trying to triangulate the perfect thing everyone's going to be excited about is like a little too cute, maybe. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, can I just kind of ask questions as I see as maybe as they relate to something that was just said? So one question that I think kind of directly speaks to that, and I think you all have already touched on it, so it might be a short answer, is just that uh, someone asked, um, given that um, welfareism, whether new or traditional, which maybe you could explain the difference of new welfareism versus traditional if you care to, or maybe we can assume many people already understand, but um, seeks to regulate rather than eliminate non-human exploitation, how can it adv advance the, end, the ends of abolitionism? And again, I know we've kind of touched on this, but there's a number of votes for it, so I figured I would give you one more chance to speak to that, I guess. Yeah, I, I think we touched on it a little bit, and I'm happy to, to speak to it more. Um, this, this, this idea that welfareism, uh, new or traditional, so the, the kind of, that, that umbrella kind of encompassing everything besides maybe um, vegan advocacy, getting individuals to go vegan, that this idea that all of these kind of uh, particular campaigns that ask for small things of the world are inherently making it harder to get to the world that we want to see by kind of reinforcing the idea that it's okay to use animals. That's, that's the idea here um, being referenced in, in my understanding. It's, it's one that I feel, it's one that I, it, it was very kind of present to me when I was kind of getting radicalized, um, getting, getting inspired as an activist. And it's, it's one that like, it makes a real intuitive emotional sense to me because I don't want to ever say that it's okay. I, I don't ever want to say it's okay to hurt animals in any way. And, I, it, and of course, and I get like, how deeply we feel that sense that we can't be asking for things that are less than what we actually want. And we are all doing that all the time, such as for asking for a fur ban, or in Denver, we're asking for a ban on the slaughterhouse in the city. That is not everything we want. That is not, that is not liberation. The, the way that it leads to, to liberation is different. For different theories of change, we have different kind of ways of understanding that. And when we're talking about kind of building political power, which I'll to let David more, um, we're talking about building political power to get the ability to ask for bigger and bigger things in, in halls of power, or, we're, or if we're talking about getting people to go vegan one by one, or if we're talking about raising the price of animal products or lowering the price of, of um, cultured meat or raising the availability until, until we have parity. All of these things are exactly as kind of incremental. And if we're, I mean, some, some like policies that I think are really exciting are like default veg. Like I haven't heard much kind of criticism, criticism of this. And of course, default veg allows for there to be a non-veg option. And when we're, when we're talking about these incremental changes, we're often talking about social norms, and when we're adjusting social norms, we're making it kind of more and more normal to not need slaughtered meat in our lives at every moment. 
And in that way, that's, that's kind of the, the pathway. So long convoluted answer, and there are a lot of different, I guess a lot of different answers for a lot of different theories of change, but this, this idea that there's anyone who isn't doing incremental work is, I think, deeply flawed. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot about the social movements who've come before us, and it's very easy to look at the, whatever the moment of victory is that we're all familiar with, and you forget about the decades that came before that, and the people working on those causes who are like us, you know, these weird people in their society who envision this totally different world, you know, that we might be living in now, and the compromise they made over decades, fighting for, uh, Mark uh, from Animal Think Tank, I was just at a retreat with him, he brought up this great example, I thought, talking about early um, marriage equality activists, or I guess just like LGBT activists who were, uh, and ended on marriage equality, ended up there as a, a big goal for the movement, but some of the stuff they were starting on was just approaching, what are, they look, what are the most heinous and egregious things we can target, just like uh, the assault and, and killing of members of the community, for example. And then of course it went on to be things like just being able to be in the military, right? You talk to any of those activists, I don't think that any of them thought like, this is my end state vision of where we're going to be. Like, this is why I'm fired up to be an activist. But they were just smart about triangulating, like, what is the low-hanging fruit? What is the thing that the average voter you talk to is going to say, this is uh, unconscionable that this is happening and we should do something about it, and landing on there. And like, you just walk down the path and then at some point, uh, same-sex marriage is legal. And then later on, it's like crazy to think of a time that it wasn't in some sense, right? It, and this is how change happens. It's, it, you know, I, I, I worked in politics a little bit before doing animal stuff and like in that world, this wouldn't even be, it's, you can't even conceive of a different way that change would happen. Like this is it. This is how society shifts through individuals one at a time and then through small pieces of institutions. And we might see the seismic shift someday and that might be what we remembered and what's in the history books but there were so many tiny steps that it took to get there. Absolutely, yeah, and I, I'm trying to be uh, you know, neutral already here, here and not uh, give my own perspective, but I will say something that actually Bruce Friedrich said about this that pretty radically changed my perspective. This was actually on that stage I showed the picture of when Gary Franstein and Bruce Friedrich had their uh, quote-unquote debate, which I think really for me was the moment that I realized how toxic a lot of this conversation had become, but also I entered that conversation more on Gary's uh, quote-unquote side, and Bruce was referring, was talking about um, uh, prison uh, reform, the prison reform movement and the prison abolition movement and how no one in the prison abolition movement, uh, which I, did, I consider myself uh, at least a kind of periphery member of, you know, I'm in favor of uh, as little human imprisonment as possible, ideally none, only for absolutely the single most heinous crimes, but I would never oppose efforts to like get better food for prisoners in jail or to get them better beds or anything like that and when Bruce mentioned about that, that even if we are to, um, even if we don't ourselves choose to work on on the welfare side, no one would say that that work to improve prisons is like the wrong thing to do because it's not abolishing prisons. And I was just like, how the if I'm if I'm an anti-speciesist, how can I apply such a radically different framework uh, to animals as I do to non-human animals as I would to human animals in this situation? And for me, that was like the turning point in this conversation for me, in which I I still think you know some welfare reforms might cause more harm than good, but I completely shifted myself from like no longer being ideologically, I guess you know opposed to them anymore after hearing that after hearing it framed that way um, I think I'm gonna ask two or three more questions if we have time for them um, well I guess I choose if we have time for them unless you guys walk off the stage um, and it seems that like the room is fairly engaged still so I don't mind doing one or two more um, let's see um, I'm not totally sure I understand this one but it's got a lot of votes so I'm gonna ask it exactly how it is and see if um, yeah I'm not I'm yeah this is, um, aside from how activists themselves come together, how does collaboration between these two sides play out at the funder or grant level? Mm. Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, it's, it's so contextual. It's, it's hard to answer. Um, but I, I guess I can maybe try a few examples. I mean, I think that there's like a direct sense that this could happen where um, you could imagine like a major ballot initiative or something in California and you have a wide coalition of groups working on it where it's like you have all these grassroots orgs that are helping gather signatures, you have organizations that are doing 
uh, investigations or some kind of expose on whatever the topic is that you're passing the ballot initiative on. You have these like professional groups of lawyers who are helping draft the legislation and, and you know, speaking on the radio and, and so forth about, about the issue. Um, and I think that funders and grants play an important role in First of all, making all of that possible, but then creating the incentives for organizations to work together. And the, you know, the reality is that this is a, a small movement, relatively speaking, with a relatively small group of very influential donors. And I think that the more sophisticated and educated the donors are about the kind of combined arms approach that we need for animals and understanding the need for collaboration, they can play an important role in helping set up that incentive structure for the groups. Like when you're checking in with organizations, making sure, are you playing well with others? Are you not getting in the way of others? Just enforcing some of the norms that we were talking about. Like, are you making it difficult for these other organizations to participate? And now obviously, just like activists, you know, particular grant making organizations or donors, they're gonna have their own point of view, their own theory of change, maybe just their own taste of like, hey, I'm connected to this, kind of group, this is the kind of group I want to support, that's great, everyone should specialize in whatever they're excited about. But there should also be an open-mindedness and a respect for the other kinds of approaches and a willingness to kind of just like check out what those folks are doing, get to know them, see where collaboration might happen. And I think the absolute most important thing to avoid is for donors to kind of like place their thumb on the scale and to create more division and to discourage groups from participating in what they think might be the strategically correct choice, even if it's not to the taste of the donor. So the, I think these are some of the ways that the, that part of the movement can participate. Yeah, another piece that kind of adds to a lot of the sense of collaboration in my mind is this kind of influx, at least in my perception of what I'm thinking of these like back office support orgs or, or capacity building organizations that exist to serve the, the whole movement. Um, I think there's a lot of unity in, in that existing. I'm thinking of groups like uh, vegan activists or, or your own sharpened strategy or um, animal defense partners. They're, they're a bunch. They're a bunch of, of organizations like this kind of doing work to as support for the rest of the movement. And from a funding perspective, which isn't kind of my area of expertise so much, the way that, that these orgs are able to kind of just be this non-denominational support for, for the, the movement kind of lightens the load on all of us and, and makes the whole, I think, the need for funding in, in general like lower, it makes us more efficient with our, our time because we don't all kind of need to recreate the exact same work. Um, yeah, it's a, a very beautiful kind of progress that our movement has made recently. I'm really glad we asked that question because I didn't fully understand what was being asked, but I think the answers were easily for me the most illuminating things that were said on the stage so far, actually, for, that I didn't already know, I guess, going into this. So thank you both for those fantastic answers. Um, I'm going to quickly, because a few of these are, are almost a little more... Um, almost logistical, I can answer a couple myself super quickly, then I'm gonna ask the last two questions that with the most votes in upside down order, I guess. So um, very quickly, I see one with a lot of votes. Uh, many of the people who most need the talk weren't here. Uh, well, well, one, I actually saw over 200 people here at peak, and I think a lot of them are some of the most influential people in the movement, so thank you all for being uh, in this room and uh, hopefully for taking this to the rest of your communities with you. But secondarily, um, I do believe this talk is gonna be available free uh, online afterward and so I, I very much encourage you to share this with anyone who uh, you think needs this more than you yourselves needed it. So that's my, my quick answer to that one. Um, I also see uh, someone asking why we insist that infighting is a bad thing. Um, doesn't it bring up issues that need to be fixed? And I think the uh, talk was pretty clear here, actually, I'm going to say about the idea that healthy criticism and conversation is a good thing, but it's the point scoring infighting that's a bad thing. Is that sufficient? Do we kind of all pretty much agree on that? Or do you have a... Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. yeah. Cool, and then, um, yeah, and I do, again, there are two more questions I'm gonna ask. Um, yeah, so I think um, one of the two questions uh, with the most votes still remaining is, um, is it possible to convince the general public to abolish all forms of animal exploitation if the most culturally um, abhorrent ones, such as factory farming, have been eliminated? Yeah, I, well, I think this speaks a lot to what Eva was saying um, earlier about, like, so I don't think anyone's gonna have a, we haven't done it yet, so it's very hard to answer this question decisively. What I will say is like, you know, find Mahi from Albert Schweitzer in Germany. 
here, you know, wherever he is at the conference this weekend. Like, talk to someone who's in a country that has very advanced animal welfare policies like Germany. And I think what Mahi will tell you is that populace and like the voting base and the consumers are much more engaged and knowledgeable about our issues. And even just like do this thought experiment. Imagine you either can be working in a country where, you know, cages have been banned and fur has been banned and and maybe even in Switzerland, where there's been a huge ballot initiative across the entire country to eliminate and phase out factory farms over the coming decades, and where the average consumer has had messaging and op-eds and debates on TV about this over and over and over. Would you rather try out your radical abolitionist messaging in that country, or in a country where animals are just fully seen as property to do with what as we please, without any consequence, where it's never even been raised as a concept that they might matter, that their suffering might matter, that what we do to them uh, might be morally wrong and should have consequences in society. Which of these two places would be more fruitful, do you think, for the abolitionist message? I think like, when you really try to imagine these worlds, to me at least, it's very clear that like, I, listen, don't get me wrong, like, yeah, you can have welfarist messaging and certification schemes and bullshit that isn't helpful. Like, I'm very open to this. I've certainly experienced it in my life. But, like, the point is that raising our issue, raising the status of animals in society, having the conversation, like, this is good. This is very good for us. This is what we want. We want this to be happening as much as possible. One of the best ways to do this is choose the issues where people agree with us, which are just by their nature going to be these kinds of reforms that for us are not going all the way. Yeah, I really love this question. Um, I love that answer, and I'm, I'll take it kind of a different direction as well. There isn't an abolitionist message, right? There are many different messages we can use to ask for what we want in the world. Um, at Pax Bana, we did 18 months of uh, a narrative study on, on this question of what's going to help, what, what kind of messaging is going to best resonate with ordinary meat-eating Americans to kind of activate their latent public support for pro-animal policies. And we didn't find a lot of um, promise with messages that were more graphic, that were more graphic about the like, particular disgusting and horrific practices, because those tended to breed a lot of defensiveness. And so we weren't really relying at all on particular abhorrent practices existing. Instead, what we could rely on was that people are deeply uncomfortable with the fact of slaughter. Like, the, f the very fact that you have to kill animals to get slaughtered meat is deeply uncomfortable, and our par study participants were really articulate about how they try not to think about it. And given a space to think about it, and, and some nudging that didn't kind of get them to shut down with defensiveness, they were able to really explore that idea and kind of get to some places that were really um, quite, quite pro-animal in the end. Um, it definitely does not rely on there being particular abhorrent practices that exist. And yeah, definitely not a, a reason to, uh, to keep them around in the meantime. Uh, yeah, very uh, strongly agreed with that, especially because it's not an opinion, it's a fact. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, this, this is great insight, uh, Eva and Dave. And um, I'm sure we could keep these conversations going forever. In fact, I hope that you two are both going to uh, maybe be upstairs at the bar afterward, and we can. Uh, there's a few questions that were not gotten to. In fact, my own question only had three votes, so I didn't uh, exercise that much uh, uh, control. I didn't ask it myself. Um, but uh, overwhelmingly, the most voted question, and don't worry, I know you all have been voting this up, and I, I've been... I've been holding off on this. By far the highest voted question is, can we see the welfareist tattoo? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maybe if, also well, at the bar if it's not stage appropriate. Uh, yeah, let's say if you come and find me at a different time this weekend when I'm wearing shorts, I will, <laughs> I will oblige. <laughs> we talked about this outfit choice and it was one of our most contentious disagreements. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that there's a few more in the audience, though. I won't, I won't name any names, but maybe there's a scavenger hunt you can participate in this weekend. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, uh, with all sincerity, uh, Eva and Dave, this is uh, one of the best conversations of this type I've ever uh, had the pleasure of witnessing or taking part in. I thank you both so much for all the thought and uh, care that you put into this. And uh, I hope everyone in this room uh, shares my, my view there and that we all came out of this uh, understanding our movement and the various kind of ways to see it a lot better. Uh, thank you both. Uh, thank you all for staying here late and joining this conversation. Thanks.